Today on the channel, we are talking about EF5 tornadoes. And more specifically, are they going extinct? Because quite honestly, we're in the longest drought ever. It's been over a decade since we last saw an EF5 tornado in the United States. That was more in 2013. So today we're going to look at this question. We're gonna see, we're gonna look at the numbers. We're gonna take a look at some theory. We're gonna see what might be driving this and then I guess we might have to leave it to you to decide. Are you ready? Let's go. Hello, welcome to the channel. My name is Rachel Sander. This is Tornado Titans. And today, well, today we're talking about those EF5 tornadoes and what is going on with them. Because since 1990, the United States has averaged about 1,200 tornadoes every single year of those. 37, 38, somewhere in there are EF3 or above. And then on average, about seven are EF4 or EF5. And then less than one every year is EF5. So EF5s are very rare. You only get less than one a year. So that means there's not even one every year on average. But there's also a lot of years where there are no EF5s. And there's a lot of years where there's several EF5s. So what's driving this? It, why has it been a decade? Because that's a long time, even with these stats. Why has it been a decade since we've had an EF5? I think the first place we need to start is the EF scale and talk about exactly how it works. The EF scale is the successor to the F scale. But let's talk about like, wh why was it invented? Well, first off, we discovered that tornadoes don't need as strong of winds to produce catastrophic damage. But in terms of the practical impacts, the EF scale and the F scale both measure damage and they're both measuring roughly the same type of damage. So when you're talking an EF5 or an F5, you're talking about really catastrophic damage. Here's the EF scale for reference. If you take a look at this, you go anywhere from EF0 up to EF5. You also have something called an EFU tornado, which is basically that a tornado happened, but nobody knows what it did because there was nothing to it, literally nothing. You see that a lot here in New Mexico, actually. But what you see with this scale is that the wind speeds have set bounds, and these wind speeds correlate with different damage indicators. There are many damage indicators, anything from trees to grass to homes and office buildings. Not every damage indicator can have an EF5 recorded in it. That's an important thing to know. It's an important piece of the puzzle because if a tornado hits a bunch of things, but none of those things are capable of measuring EF5 strength, then the tornado cannot be an EF5. And at least as the system has been set up for the last uh, over decade. But going forward, there are some other context clues that can be incorporated into a tornado rating. Say there is something that can't get to a five, but you get winds measured that are EF5 from radar, plus a couple other context clues, maybe it can be rated EF5. They're continually improving the scale, but the scale is trying to stay consistent with itself and with history to ensure some scientific accuracy. Now it goes without saying though, that the EF scale, when you're measuring these damage indicators, it's entirely subjective, it has to be. There's no way to say this type of winds did this. It has to be from someone who is an expert in the field. There are people who measure tornadoes who have done this for years and years and years, and they're engineers, they're experts in weather. I mean, th there's all these different fields that come together to rate tornadoes. It's as scientifically accurate as you can make it given today's technology and limitations. So when we're talking about why there hasn't been an EF5 in over a decade, you have to keep in mind that we're dealing with an imperfect, but still highly accurate scale in many ways, okay? Now there's obviously some possible limitations to this, right? Because what if a tornado is 2.6 miles wide, Radar measures it as having nearly 300 mile per hour winds just above the surface, but it doesn't really hit anything. It looks like an EF5, quacks like an EF5, right? But it's an EF3 because that's the only thing we can measure. That's, a, that, that's one of the limitations of the scale, right? I'm talking about El Reno in 2013, of course, but there's several other uh, tornadoes like that. And even in recent history, 2011, you had both Chickasha and Goldsby 
in Oklahoma, May 24th, which were rated as 199 mile per hour EF4s, called plausible EF5s, but they could not find a damage indicator that quite, that quite lived up to that. You've seen it, that, that kind of language several times. And it's made worse because if a tornado also goes through a place that might in theory have EF5 damage indicators, but the homes are poorly constructed, which is oftentimes something that you see in the South, it's also very hard to find EF5 damage. So the, br the burden of proof for EF5s is really high. That's one reason why it's hard to find them, but also some years you just get a lot. Now, speaking of 2011, you had six EF5 tornadoes that year. That was ridiculous. Like many of them happened on April 27th, 2011, the Super Outbreak 2.0. I'm sure you're well familiar with that. But also there were tornadoes that happened May 24th, 2011, that day I just talked about. The Piedmont El Reno tornado was an EF5, so was Joplin. So there have been a lot of years where there have been some, a lot of really violent tornadoes. In fact, you can see it in the data. There is some clustering that happens, it seems like, where some years just have the juice and other years don't. What would be driving that? Let's talk about it. Now, one of the things you see in the numbers is that every year since 1990, there has been an EF4 or above tornado, except for one, 2018. Why did it not happen in 2018? Well, let's talk a little bit about how the jet stream can help make tornadoes happen. Tornadoes depend on several things to happen, right? First off, you need a supercell thunderstorm for these most violent tornadoes happen almost always, which that requires instability, lift, and wind shear. You also typically need a supercell that's somewhat isolated, so you need some capping. You need a lot of different things to come together to produce a violent tornado, including very strong wind shear typically. Now, how do you get very strong wind shear? You at least need enough to get a supercell, but also maybe just a little bit more. You need a strong jet stream. Every, now, th this is something that is hard to quantify from year to year because every year, even in the quiet years, there's gonna be at least one or two systems that are kind of powerful moving through. 2013, the last time we had an EF5 was a prime example of this, where there was like nothing happening all spring. And then late May came around and it was just a bonanza of tornadoes including that unfortunate and deadly EF5 and more. So what you're looking for is you're looking for a powerful jet stream to help fuel big time severe weather. Something you see on SPC outlooks on big risk days, right? You see strong, long track, even violent tornadoes possible today. And why do they say that? Because conditions are at a certain level to where these things are more possible because Strong and long track violent tornadoes typically are associated with days with higher wind shear. That's the changing of winds and wind speed with height in the atmosphere. There are exceptions to this. Gerald, EF5 back in the 90s, very little wind shear, right? But that storm did make a little bit more by doing some funky things, but we're not gonna get into that. That's a case study for another day. But you're seeing this where you need a lot of wind shear to create tornadoes. There is a theory out there, piece of the climate theory, what, how the atmosphere is changing, that maybe the jet stream overall is weaker and those windows are smaller. But as we talked with Dr. Walker Ashley on this channel, which you can check out that card right there, there is still gonna be a lot of wind shear even into the future according to climate models. They're just gonna be clustered. And so th this may not be the best explanation for why there haven't been EF5 tornadoes. It's one of the theories, maybe the wind shear is weaker, but I don't think that one fully makes it work. So what about the EF scale? Let's, let's critique it for a little bit. Now, a lot of people wanna go after the EF scale and the people who rate tornadoes, right? That this is something you see all the time. These people are wrong. They're completely incompetent. That's, that, I, that can't be the case because these people are experts. They've rated tornadoes EF5 before, okay? So they're not purposely not letting an EF5 happen. But is it too strict? That's something they have actually worked on in the new updates to the Enhanced Vegeta scale to allow for more opportunities for things like EF5, for ratings like EF5. Because they're, they're, it, it's taken a little bit of study to possibly find correlations that might lead raters to think about putting a tornado from EF4 to EF5. This is something that has been in the works for a while. And uh, I think that this may be one thing that helps improve the accuracy of the scale, 
but is it going to lead to more EF5 tornadoes? Well, what if we take a look at something called a hurricane and something that happened just recently as well? So it wasn't that long ago that we had a massive break in major hurricane landfalls in the US, years and years and years. And people were asking, well, has something shifted? Is the climate different? It, it, what, what's going on here? Or is the explanation just pure dumb luck? Like it might just be with EF5s. Is the explanation that maybe we're just in a weird lull and it's gonna break? Because what happened when that major hurricane landfall streak that we just had none broke? We've had a record number of major and catastrophic hurricanes come ashore, anything category three, four, and five, at a pace we've never seen before here in the US. Never happened. And so what happened is that wall broke into a record period. So this doesn't mean you cannot extrapolate. It's been a decade since an EF5, right? Does not mean that that's gonna exist in another decade. We may look back at this decade as a blessed period of quiet, because maybe, just maybe, we're gonna see a lot of EF5s once this breaks. You don't know, okay? You just don't know. One thing to keep in mind with the EF scale as well, one final thing to take for the road, is that even when you have an EF5, it is usually only like a small concentrated area, maybe one property that gets that rating. But the whole tornado's rated EF5. But if you look at a tornado track, for instance, take a look at this track of more, you see the vast majority of the tornado's track so you look at this damage picture, it's not EF5, but look how destructive this is, right? When you take a look at these tornadoes, these particularly catastrophic tornadoes, only a very small sliver of the damage is EF5. The rest of it is that two, three, four. And when you take a look at it, when you think about that, this right here is almost all not EF5 damage. You're talking about splitting hairs in terms of human impact. EF3 means that your house is destroyed. EF2, your house is destroyed. Practical impacts need to take shelter. It's already there whether this tornado is EF5 or not. What is interesting, what's important is scientific accuracy, of course. But when you're talking about human impact, you don't need an EF5 for a tornado to be highly impactful. We've seen it in recent years, Rolling Fork. We've seen them in Kentucky. So you do not want to underestimate tornadoes that aren't EF5. And so lastly, what do you think? What has happened? Why has there been a decade since we have seen an EF5? Are we just seeing pure dumb luck? Is there something wrong with the scale? What's going on? I wanna hear from you in the comments because I think this could be, it could be a lively discussion. And maybe just maybe I'll get one of those experts who go out in the field and rate tornadoes on the channel soon and we'll talk about how they work on their process because I think that would be fascinating. With that said though, remember, 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 weather's for everybody. That does include you. Be sure to subscribe and we will see you next time. Got it done. No, we really did. We're done. We're done. We're done.